Good evening and welcome to the August 28th, 2018 City Council Special Meeting and Mayor Debbie Bertland. Um, and welcome back fellow council members and community. I think we've had approximately a month off. So I uh, hope people have been able to tune out and refresh for a little bit. Um, the first order of business is actually to have the city clerk call roll. Thank you, Mayor Bertland. We'll start with Mayor Bertland. Here. Deputy Mayor Nice. Present. Councilmember Acker. Here. Councilmember Bassett. Here. Councilmember Weaker. Here. Councilmember Wiesentiner. Here. And Councilmember Wong. Great. Thank you. So the next item of business is to approve the agenda. Council, can I have a motion as presented? So moved. Second. First and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, I, I meant to say aye. Apologies. Okay. So motion passes and the agenda is approved. We have one item of special business this evening, AB 5466, which is WASH.I-405 rent into Bellevue widening and express toll lanes project. And for that, we will have senior project manager Kirsten Taylor kick it off. Thank you. So I would like to introduce, sorry for the last minute scramble, we are coming from one meeting to this meeting. Um, so um, and would you be interested in waiting for the city manager to arrive or should we continue? How long will it be? I would say I expect shortly. Why don't but, we go ahead and get, but just go ahead. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay, all right, thank you. So for the record, Kirsten Taylor, Senior Project Manager, and I would like to introduce um, the I-405 um, State Route 167 Program Administrator, Kim Henry from WashDOT, who will be providing a briefing on this project to the council and to the community. Thank you and welcome. Um, good evening and thank you for having me here. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about 405. Um, I'm just going to jump right into uh, the, the presentation. If I can get this to work. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, so on Interstate 405, we uh, have a, a master plan, and that master plan was uh, adopted back in 2002. And that was a result of uh, an EIS that we had completed in the corridor. And as we were going through that process uh, to develop this plan, we had a committee of elected officials and agency heads that really helped develop the plan, but uh, that committee continues to be actively involved. Uh, with the program today, we meet on a, about a quarterly basis. Um, because this is, is a, a multimodal and multi-agency uh, program, we continue to track with all of our agency partners uh, the, the progress that, that everybody is continuing to make up and down the corridor. Um, and so, so far, we're, we're making pretty good progress, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, these are the, the projects that are either completed or funded. Um, and we're continuing to make progress with uh, the different components as we work through those. Um, one of the, the most important next steps that we've adopted as part of that master plan is a, a 40 mile system of express toll lanes. And that's incorporating the 167 hot lanes in with express toll lanes on 405. So uh, the first ones to get started were the hot lanes. We've, we've had those around now for quite a while. And then we opened the express toll lanes from downtown Bellevue all the way up to I-5 and in Linwood. 
Um, but we, we had really a, a significant missing gap, and that was the section in orange up there on the map, and that was the section between uh, Renton to Bellevue. And, and that is really one of our most congested freeway sections that we have in the, in the state. So the legislature did fund that project in, in 2015 with uh, connecting Washington. And so we have been moving forward. That is actually divided up into three different uh, construction phases. And the first phase of that project is already underway um, with uh, interchange improvements at the 405-167 interchange. And, and this is a critical component in order to really connect uh, the hot lanes into the 405 express toll lanes. Um, that project right now today is moving ahead of schedule. Um, we're really been happy with the progress we've been making. Um, and so we are, um, we'll be finishing that up before uh, 2019. Uh, the second and most significant part then of the construction phases that we have here with the program is the widening between uh, the interchange down in Renton all the way up into downtown Bellevue and connecting uh, those, those different projects together. Um, this is a very large project. Our, our contract upset price on, on this is $710 million. So it really represents a, a fair amount of work. And in order to move forward with this, we have two different environmental documents. And one of them is the uh, downtown Bellevue vicinity. So that's going from I-90 in through downtown. And then the second environmental document goes, stretches from I-5 in the Tukwila area all the way up to Interstate 90. Um, the first one is now complete. We have that work already done. And we are um, nearing completion on the, uh, the second document. Um, there are certainly a number of different impacts that are part of these projects, but um, these, proje these impacts are all being mitigated. Um, and so we are uh, replacing wetlands and, and improving fish passage. And so all those types of things are, are being added in with this particular project. Um, we continue to do coordination with our, our partners here in the, the corridor. Um, we have uh, Sound Transit that we continue to work with, King County on the regional trail system, and we also are working with uh, the city of Bellevue in coordinating work on the Mountains of Sound Greenway Trail. Um, a couple of important dates here, and just in terms of the progress of this uh, project, we are already starting the procurement process, uh, and so we have just kicked off here in August the request for qualifications from contractors. Our RFP will go out in November, and then uh, in August of 2019, we'll get started with the construction of the project. Um, this map just shows where we have some different improvements going on through the corridor. And so uh, what we're doing, adding one lane, the entire length of the section between Highway 167 and downtown Bellevue, that added lane will be coupled then with the HOV lane. And those two lanes together will create the, a dual express tolling system. Uh, up there on the map, you'll also see a couple of green sections. And so those are where we have some auxiliary lanes. So um, the first one there at the top of the map is from I-90 down through 112. I think that probably everybody who drives through that section uh, recognizes the level of congestion that we have there getting through the Coal Creek interchange. And so we have an added lane that will take us all the way down to 112th interchange, giving the added capacity that's needed to help smooth um, those merges out and reduce that congestion through there. And then we also have one uh, between 44th and 30th for the Kennedale Hill area. Um, this shows uh, some, some details of, of what's going on between downtown Bellevue and I-90. Um, one of the problems that we have today is there's so much traffic that is going from Bellevue to Issaquah area that we have standing traffic actually stuck in the middle of the freeway. Um, which then really influences the traffic that's trying to go west um, on I-90, so traffic trying to go towards Mercer Island, but also it really impacts the through traffic. Uh, as part of this project, we're going to be creating a dual lane uh, off-ramp that goes towards Issaquah in that direction. Um, getting that traffic moving is going to really help free up uh, the flow of traffic through that entire section. Um, these congestion contours then show what it really looks like in terms of traffic congestion that we have out there. 
Um, and so with these, we have a, a sets that show both northbound and southbound direction of travel for both the HOV and uh, the regular lanes of travel, um, both with and without the project in 2025. So um, with these, they're color coded to show what it looks like um, based on the level of congestion. So black is the very worst color. That's just stop and go traffic that doesn't move. Uh, red is heavy, heavy congestion. And then uh, on the other end of the scale, we have green that is uh, free flow conditions. So for this, uh, we're showing the morning traffic uh, projections and uh, along the bottom, we have times that stretch between uh, 5 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And then uh, the vertical axis here shows where you are in the, the corridor. And so at the bottom of each of these graphs, it has I-5, so that's I-5 at Tukwila, and then at the top, it's 520 in downtown Bellevue. So you can see where you are at any particular point in the corridor. Um, when we're talking about the, the morning traffic, really the, the primary uh, traffic flow direction is northbound. And so if we look at the left-hand side of, of the chart here where we have uh, the northbound traffic uh, flow, we have both the HOV lane and the general purpose lanes that are congested throughout the entire morning all the way up through the 44th interchange in north end of Renton. Um, and then you get a little bit of a break in travel patterns and, and as you hit uh, I-90 downtown Bellevue area, you see we get congestion again. So then as we look at what happens with the project, if you go to the very far right side of the page, um, all of the traffic congestion that we have between Tuckwilla and north end of, of Renton really disappears. Uh, we still have a little bit of uh, uh, congestion through I-90 and downtown Bellevue, uh, but we also still have projects as part of our master plan that we will be coming back with and, and adding more capacity to address some of these problems. So this is uh, a, an important next phase, but it doesn't really address all of our problems in the corridor yet. Um, this is the same information for the PM peak and the uh, predominant flow is in the, the southbound direction and so getting out of downtown Bellevue in the afternoon, uh, getting through I-90 area and south of there is really the big challenge, uh, just heavy, heavy congestion that goes on all afternoon and, and through the early evening hours. Um, then as we look over at the other side of the page, uh, we see in the southbound direction with the project that we really have cleared up all of that congestion. And so all those improvements we're making coming out of downtown uh, Bellevue in and around the I-90 interchange are really making a, a very substantial difference in the overall traffic flow. Uh, one of the problems you'll see though as you look all the way at the bottom of that chart is we do now have uh, new congestion that's happening at the uh, Tukwila I-5 interchange area and that's because we've really opened up the bottleneck, uh, we've got more traffic flowing down to that area um, and that is creating additional backup there. So we have once again more projects on the master plan list that will come back and address those particular uh, problem areas, uh, but this project does not yet address that. Uh, we're also working with uh, our partners at, at King County for the uh, regional trail on the East Side Rail Corridor. We'll, we're building about two and a half miles of that trail for King County. Um, and we'll be connecting up from um, uh, about where the, the Seahawks facility is all the way up to the Coal Creek area as well as a new crossing where the old Wilburton Tunnel used to be for bike and pedestrians. Um, we're also working closely with is that picture you just showed us where the old bridge used to be and you're putting it back in? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're also working with our, our partners at, at Sound Transit uh, as part of their implementation of bus rapid transit to include inline transit station. This is a transit station at 44th. So uh, the ramp comes up out of the middle of the express toll lanes um, and into then a center transit stop. Uh, where they are then able to get right back onto the freeway again as they go through. Um, this interchange design also utilizes uh, a lot of roundabouts here, which keeps traffic flowing. And the traffic that you're seeing in this particular 
another video here is 2045 traffic. And uh, if you've traveled out there in the mornings at all, you've seen that um, this area is extremely congested today. Um, and with the improvements on the freeway, we've got fewer people wanting to bypass on arterials. They instead are getting on the freeway where they would normally get on. And then also with uh, the roundabouts, it moves better through the freeway. Excuse me, could you just, uh, going back to that for a moment. Sure. Uh, help us understand what the, where a bus would actually go. So you're seeing maybe a- Maybe you've got a laser pointer there, you might. Uh, <laughs> And I guess we actually see a bus there, There's don't a bus we? right there. Okay. And so that's the bus stop. And right across from that right there is the, the northbound direction. So we are looking north through this, uh, from this angle right here. And you can see the, the express toll lanes are on the median side. Um, we have congestion in the, the right-hand lanes, the regular lanes. Um, that roundabout in the top of the page right there is where the access from the new on-ramp, northbound on-ramp is going. Okay, so the, the bus never left the overpass though. It, it came up the off-ramp, uh, went or just uh, around two legs of the uh, roundabout and then right back onto the, onto the freeway there. Correct, correct? so it, it comes right across yeah. Um, doesn't really leave the freeway. It drops uh, passengers right there. And then in the, um, if I can, I'll go back just a second here. Um, in this quadrant right here, um, Sound Transit is looking to uh, construct a new park and ride lot. So there will be then fairly uh, easy access back and forth from the transit stop from the park and ride. Thank you very much. So the uh, Renton to Bellevue project really consists of three different construction phases that is, as I'd mentioned earlier, and those are the top three lines on this uh, schedule. Uh, the first one being the, the interchange improvements that are underway today. Uh, the second one down is the Renton to Bellevue widening project. Um, the third contract is really uh, work that's going on off the freeway uh, and so it doesn't really influence as much uh, some of the activities that need to be done and so that's the third phase. Um, as you can see we have a box up there for early completion in 2020 for the King County Trail. We've worked with uh, King County and the bike community to try and get that done uh, very early on in the, in the project. Uh, then at 2024 we have a, a vertical dashed line and that line is when Sound Transit plans to have their bus rapid transit uh, in operation in the corridor and so we're trying to get all of our projects complete by that time frame so we have the infrastructure in place uh, to allow the bus rapid transit to operate in the, the corridor. And then that's really it and I can take any questions if you have any. Thank you, I, th I think that was helpful. Um, council, Bruce. Well, I, um, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna ask a question that I think you, is answered by the heat maps that you've provided, but I'll ask it for the benefit of uh, um, putting it out there because at least one citizen in something I saw posted had expressed it. And that is, uh, in looking at this Renton to Bellevue uh, north of I-90, page, the, mm -hmm. the trend, the change um, that's proposed there, there was an expression of frustration that somehow um, uh, Mercer Island residents would be shortchanged by this change in the, in the roadway configuration. Uh, what, what I see is that we clearly are uh, losing the, the HOV lane uh, over at the right side of the road that extended all the way from the Southeast 8th ramp, I think it's Southeast 8th, up and into the I-90 uh, transition. But from the look of your heat map, uh, I, I'm guessing you would say that's not much of a loss because what we do is go from a situation where a lot of, there's a lot of backup for everybody to one where there's uh, much less, but I'll let you 
tell me what you'd say about that. No, I, I, yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. And so there's been some lane reassignment, and we do have that, that right-hand HOV lane that uh, extends between Southeast 8th and I-90. Um, but the, the volume of traffic that uses that is, is really very, very small. And so by getting the, rea, uh, the reassignment of the lanes through there, and we still have the, the connections uh, into the I-90. So we still have, at the interchange, we have the, the HOV connections, and we still have the GP connections. But by getting all the traffic flowing through the interchange area, it's really going to be much better for everybody. And so um, it, that entire section and area has, has really uh, turned into a free flow travel trip, which I think is, is a benefit for everybody. Thank you. Tom? Um, I actually can't take credit for this question. We, <laughs> one of our local activists called me up and there was a gal named Sarah Fletcher that you probably know and does a lot of research. <laughs> She's been in contact with us, yes. Yeah, um, one of the concerns that, that she had brought up is that the buses now appear to have to cross over four lanes to get to the HOV lane to get to I-90. Is that, am, it looks like like that is true according to this map. So um, yeah, we, we do have uh, some, let's see if I go back to here. Um, and so we do have uh, an extra uh, lane uh, at the interchange to go across there. but. We've also, as we've implemented this um, in the north end, uh, we've gotten, uh, I, I think, some, some pretty good hands-on experience with the operations um, and some good lessons learned about access and distances between interchanges. Um, what we're finding is that we did need to go in and make some adjustments in a few different places, and we've taken that knowledge gained and applied it to this project. And so at this particular location, our, our access um, between where you can transition out of the express toll lanes and move over to the ramps is um, getting close to a mile in overall length. So it stretches from about Southeast 8th where the on-ramp connects in all the way down towards the I-90 interchange, which is actually more room for merging across lanes than, than we have in most places in the corridor. So it's, it's not what I would consider um, a difficult, challenging uh, weave movement from one end to the other, but it, it's, it's something that we do pay attention to. Yeah, I'm just um, wondering if, uh, it, it definitely is gonna free up the HOV lanes, people are gonna move faster, but um, when you have large vehicles crossing four lanes to get to an exit it doesn't on the map i wouldn't have thought that that merge over is a mile long uh, to i-90 westbound that top upper right hand lane and then also um, the exit portals when you went live with the hot lanes on northbound 405 i drive from renton to everett twice a day um, i remember that the gaps that you could get out of those lanes were very small, so you had to basically look for them and then jettison yourself across all four lanes to get to Totem Lake or Kirkland or whatever it was. Are, are those gaps gonna be longer for people to ingress and egress out of those lanes? Um, yeah, this project's gonna be a lot different than that project <laughs> was in that um, we are adding capacity the entire length of the corridor, which the first project, the Bellevue to Linwood, um, we did not add that many lane miles of capacity. And so we ended up with some congestion points in, in the general purpose lanes, the regular yeah. lanes, and which made it harder then to merge in or out um, because of that congestion. Uh, with the capacity, the entire length of the freeway here, that's going to change that. Um, and so as you, one of the things we were really paying attention to is where were the choke points going to be occurring this time around, and then what could we do to, to mitigate those particular problems. So it, it's going to be uh, look and feel a lot different. I think um, because we had been getting some uh, questions about what that looks like, I think I in included uh, maybe a little more detail here, um, and this might be kind of hard to see, so I didn't want to really use it unless, unless there was some thoughts about that, but um, 
you can see on the, the, the map on the right hand side there where the purple lanes are is what the new design is going to be looking like. And you see where the arrows are at the bottom there, that's where the Southeast 8th on-ramp comes on. And at that point is where the double white lines will end. And it's just open then for merging uh, all the way uh, across. So there's um, then that time to, to uh, make a couple of lane, different lane changes and, and get into the off-ramp flow of traffic. Okay, I've got a question. Um, again, going back to the heat map and looking at northbound 405 I-90 North. Well, uh, let's start with the morning. When you look at the without the project and the with project, I, mean, I, I can't tell from a numeric perspective whether there's more or less congestion. Let's, you know, for conversation's sake, say that it's, it's roughly the same. So in that stretch between I-92 Northeast 8th or that 520 interchange, there's not much of a delta either way. Not much change. You did reference, however, that you were, um, that there were additional projects that were adding capacity yes. there because that clearly is a, a, a painful point for us now. I'm sure it will only be more painful as, as more people move to the region. <coughs> Can you outline for us what some of those additional projects would be in the timelines that might actually bring hopefully some of that red to more of a a yellow or a green? Sure. Um, as as uh, part of our, our master plan, we still have um, a lot of redesign work and reconstruction to do on uh, the I-90-405 interchange area. And as part of that design, um, we have uh, direct access ramps. Some of the one we were just building down at 405 and 167 today that would take traffic from the inside of I-90 from the HOV lane into the, the center of, of 405 into the express toll lanes. Um, and so as a, as a uh, I would say probably a medium priority project on our list of projects, uh, we had identified uh, two of those projects uh, that needed to move forward. And so we had been talking with the legislature about that for, for several years. Um, and unfortunately, they haven't been funded yet, so I can't really project when that will happen. <laughs> Uh, but they continue to remain on our priority list for the, the medium range uh, set of priorities here. So um, we would like to see those move forward at, in the not too distant future. Um, I, Kirsten, it would be terrific if we could find out more about those projects so that we can raise that if and when we have conversations with our delegates to both the House and the Senate. Mm -hmm. Because if All there's right. projects that need a little bit of encouragement and or additional funding, it would be good for us to know. We, uh, we keep, a, we keep a, a map, so Representative Cliburn has uh, encouraged us to uh, put together an uh, informational map uh, that she's been able to use uh, with the legislature, and, and so we try to keep that up to date. And we're always happy to, to share that if there's an interest in that, uh, both of uh, funded projects, projects under construction, and then the next priority projects in the, in the program. That would be super. Thank you. Celine? So uh, just a quick question on the heat maps. Can you tell me the with project versus without project, are the levels and volumes of traffic the same, or is it 2025 traffic with the project versus today's infrastructure with today's traffic? So uh, there are slight changes in, in traffic volume that occur with and without the project. Um, and so as we look at 2025, there is increased traffic from today. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that happens around the region is that our area freeways, our area arterials are already mostly operating at capacity. And so when we build this project, we're not necessarily going to see a ton of additional traffic getting through some of those uh, uh, freeways and arterials that are already operating at capacity. And so there will be some increases, but they aren't going to be um, huge amounts of increase in, in overall travel. So you're using basically the number of trips that exist today on today's infrastructure versus 2025 infrastructure. Well, no, there'll be 2025 trips. That, so there that's is an increase, heat, yeah. That's what the heat map represents. Yeah, it represents 2025 traffic. Um, this is just 2025 as we're doing uh, our analysis. We also look at 2045 traffic. So we are, are looking um, at traffic near term and longer term as, as well so that we are planning for the future. 
Tom, did you have another question? Um, yes. Um, on the volumes of, uh, volume of cars is one thing, but volume of buses, with these improvements, do you anticipate there will be more buses that will be diverted to Mercer Island? So uh, we would need to, um, I think, uh, probably bring uh, the transit agencies in on this conversation, but my understanding in working with Sound Transit um, is that w with the opening of uh, the light rail, um, there will probably be fewer buses making that movement in the future than, than what there are today. Um, I think that uh, they're trying to bring all of the bus rapid transit into downtown Bellevue to the transit center as then a potential transfer point for people to go then uh, whatever different direction they want to go to from there. Do, do you, um, I guess, Kristen, this is maybe a question for you. What I'd like to see is how many buses are projected to be coming to Mercer Island in the future and an update on the, what was formerly going to be called the, uh, the bus intercept because if less buses are coming into the city, maybe less cars will be coming into the city and then there's the whole parking element too. So at um, some point, just get an update on that. Just, just reiterating that the, the, the whole bus inter intercept scheme, including the volumes of buses, all operational parameters are part of the sound transit agreement yep. and a function of conversation between Metro Sound Transit and the city. Um, so any change there from what is actually in the agreement today would obviously involve a tremendous amount of discussion and analysis. Mm -hmm. So um, I would encourage us to start with what that sound transit agreement says. Yep. yep. And then if we could get an update, that would be great. <laughs> I just assumed you were working with uh, sound transit on some of that and just had some preliminary data. But thank you. All right. Yeah, most of our focus has been um, on supporting the north-south trips uh, up and down 405 and, and the transit stations they needed on 405. So I'm less familiar with um, uh, the bus issues coming this direction. Council, any further questions? Well, thank you. I think it was, it was very helpful. Um, some good questions asked. I'm sure we'll be looking forward to some updates in the well, coming months and years. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, if there are questions, we're always happy to uh, um, find some answers for those. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, oh. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes our special business for this evening. Next on the agenda, we have the city manager's report. Welcome city manager, Julie Underwood. Good evening, mayor and council. Just thank you, <laughs> the clicker. So welcome back. You had a good month off. Now we're gonna have a busy, busy fall. Um, let me remind you, we just launched the city's new online community engagement platform called Let's Talk Mercer Island. This custom website will make it easier for residents and business owners to engage with the city on major issues at a time and place that's convenient for our residents. Let's Talk features uh, interactive tools, including discussion forums, polls, surveys, and crowdsource mapping. The city will use the online feedback in conjunction, of course, with our typical activities, uh, such as face-to-face -face meetings, hearings, and other surveys. So please visit letstalk.mercergov.org and sign up and get started and start asking us questions and engaging in um, thoughtful conversation. The city is proposing amendments to the comprehensive plan and we want your feedback. So proposed for um, 2018 comp plan amendments include policy discussions related to the J, critical areas protections, transportation level of service, arts and culture policies and many others. You can provide, a, you can see a list of course, on the city's website, and we are already seeing lots of great feedback, of course, on the Let's Talk platform as well. 
Really excited. This month, we were featured in the Association of Washington Cities, City Vision Magazine, and really it was around um, the city's effort to really plan for the workforce of today and tomorrow. Um, featured in the magazine is um, myself, Jason, Mike, Chris, give a shout out, they're back there. So um, please take a, take a moment to read it. I think it's a great article and really highlights some of the uh, really nice things that Mercer Island has been doing before me and, um, and uh, since I've come here. Uh, MIPA's annual summer concert will be this Thursday, August 30th at 6 p.m. at Mercer Dell Park. The Mercer Island Preschool Association is hosting their annual summer concert and will feature Casper Baby Pants as this year's musical guest. The concert is a free family event uh, geared, geared towards preschool age kids. Maybe Elliot would like to go. <laughs> <laughs> bring your friends and extended family and bring a picnic blanket and your dancing shoes I want to call your attention to the Rainier freeway station um, changes it will close September 22nd and not reopen again until 2023 we do have a number of bus routes that are going to uh, be affected uh, buses 550, the 554, and 216. So both the 550 and 216 will now bypass R Rainier Avenue and continue to Seattle by the I-90 mainland. So Route 550 will access downtown via the transit tunnel, and Route 216 will access downtown via 4th Avenue South. Route 554 will now stop at Rainier Avenue South and South Charles Street, and the 554 will continue downtown via South Dearborn Street. So if you'd like to check out the details of this, please visit soundtransit.org. CERT classes are starting September 5th, and for those of you who don't know, CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team. CERT classes are designed to teach citizens to be better prepared to respond to and cope after a, a natural disaster or man-made disaster. At the end of the seven-week course, a CERT will have training in fire safety, disaster, medical, search and rescue, communications, and more. CERT classes take place Wednesday evenings from 6.30 to 9.30 here at City Hall in the Emergency Operations Center. If you'd like to register, please contact Officer Jennifer Franklin. Also on Friday, that's next Friday, September 7th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., the city will conduct its annual earthquake exercise. The purpose of this exercise is to test the ability of our city staff, volunteers, and partners to respond and recover from a 9.0 subduction earthquake. The drill will take place at two locations here at the Emergency Operations Center and at our emergency shelter at the Community Center. So note this exercise is really only for city emergency staff and volunteers and should not disrupt any daily life for our residents. The Chamber is hosting its fifth annual Art Uncorked event next Friday, September 7th. Enjoy an evening of wine tasting, art, and music, as well as food at the Outdoor Sculpture Gallery. This year's event features 22 Washington wineries, breweries, and cider makers. Percentage of the proceeds will benefit the Mercer Island Youth and Family Services, as well as the high school's DECA program. You can visit Mercer Island Art Uncorked to purchase tickets. And of course, guests must be 25, 21 or older, and minors and strollers are the only minors allowed in. Back to school happens next Wednesday, September 5th. So remember to watch out for kids walking or biking to and from school. Um, you'll probably see our officers out there making sure um, you are obeying the speed limit through those school zones. In observance of Labor Day, city facilities will be closed on Monday, September 3rd. This also includes the community center, so there'll be no programs and no rentals then. And that's all I have.
Great, thank you very much. Okay, the next item of business um, is appearances, and this is the opportunity for anyone to speak to the City Council on any item. When it's your turn to address the Council, please be sure to speak audibly into the podium microphone, state your name and address for the record, and limit your comments to three minutes. So we're ready to go. Welcome. Good evening, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to address you again. My name is Jim Schwab, and I'm the president of the HOA for 7800 Plaza Building, which is the building that adjoins the Tully site uh, that we're going to be that we've been talking about now for a number of months. Uh, I must. Uh, I just wanted to. I, I I worry a little bit about this building in the sense that it feels a little bit like we're an orphan. We're the only condo project downtown. We're 24 units of residences and three commercial units, and we kind of sit off to the side a little bit. And when I appeared the last time, I wanted to uh, encourage you to uh, include us in the planning process as you move forward with the acquisition of this site. And I was a little disturbed that I thought the project got ahead of us before we've been invited to participate. I think that's been corrected and we in fact have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow uh, so we can I think catch up even though it seems like a lot of uh, activity has gone on without our input which always gives uh, rise to concerns and we uh, we always want to think the worst in terms of how the, the, the project gets designed and I'm sure we'll get through that but um, uh, that was one of the things that I want to mention wanted to mention and also wanted to say that I think we've gotten that corrected the other thing that I think is maybe more important is that in my role as a representative of the building, there are at least 25% of the units that would be, I think, severely impacted by a total build out of the site if you were to rezone it as proposed and build five story projects that'll cut off sight lines and light uh, that'll affect uh, units that uh, face the north side of the building in particular. And so we, uh, you know, we, even within the building, we have different interests and, and different concerns, but we want to present one uh, common uh, uh, face for the whole project. Uh, we met last night as a group, and, uh, uh, and we're, we want to work in every way that we can. We're all Mercer Island people. We're all taxpayers. We're all supportive of progress here in the community. And I think there actually is a pretty strong sentiment within the group to be supportive of the MICA project, if that should end up uh, somehow integrated into that site. We have a number of folks who feel really uh, strongly about that that location as a, as a favorable site for that project. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Thanks for your service. And uh, we'll look forward to working with uh, Julie and Kirsten uh, tomorrow and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else for public appearances? Um, hey, uh, Brian Hildebrandt, 6880 West Mercer Way. Um, I actually came here like three weeks ago. I wanted to see the uh, RFP. Like, uh, I believe the council was going to review that at that time. I think that m must have been rescheduled. So um, I, I think I'm going to go back and look at the, uh, look at the videos. But I, I hope that the RFP hasn't been uh, already um, submitted. and. Uh, Okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and I just wanted to, you know, remind the council that that was that's really important. Um, I think parking is actually it's it's okay right now, um, but I I'm I'm very worried about what's going to happen when people go back to school, and I think there's going to be a big, big increase. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, just uh, just wondering what happened with that, and it seems like uh, it seems like the council's on it. But Thanks. you just, thank just so I, he's, you're aware, you, that's on our agenda for today. Yeah, yeah, Bruce, thank you. Um, yes, yeah. it is. It's on the agenda. It's the first Excellent. thing to be. So if you want to stick around, that yeah. would be terrific. Thank you. It, it, no. it, but he asked if there was an RFP. This is an RFQ. It's an RFQ, and it's, it's a little different. So when we stick around, we're talking about the RFQ for the Tully's uh, and Beyond site. Just, well, I, just. To complete the thought, if a citizen did have comment that they wanted the council to consider in, in its deliberations tonight, now would be the 
presumably the last opportunity for a citizen to do that. And so uh, for Mr. Hildebrand, I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, this, this is your chance if you wanted to give us comment um, on that. Uh, well, I, that's, um, can I encourage you to come back down and then maybe we can set the three minutes again? Paul, would you? And, and my apologies for breaking things up a little bit there, but I, I did think it was. I, but but I, I think confusion, so. this isn't the last chance. Tonight we're asking for uh, RFQ. Can we, can we just let's pause. I would prefer actually, Julie, would you like to summarize actually what is on the agenda for this evening with regard to the site? Happy to Mayor Bertland. Um, we're reviewing for the second time, the second draft for the RFQ. Um, we're hoping the council will uh, finalize that this evening and then we can get it out to potential um, developers by, before, by the end of the week and hopefully we'll have about a five, six week process to drum up interest and of course our primary interest in that property is parking. Okay, so um, yeah. we are in the public appearances section of the meeting. Would you like to share some yeah. thoughts, concerns, Sorry. opportunities? Um, yeah, I apologize for making a mess of procedure. Not at all. Um, uh, I'd just like to remind the council that it, a parking solution um, that that uh, kicks residents out of parking at, at certain times or uh, makes it, you know, makes it difficult for them, like basically time constraints parking is, uh, it, that's not an acceptable mixed use solution. That's my only concern at this point. <laughs> Great, thank you. Welcome. Howdy y'all. Uh, Paul Shoemaker, 4546 Forest, and uh, part of the MICA team. So a couple thoughts. One with my citizen hat on, when we get to the RFQ, I just wanna reinforce that I think um, for me, my friends, my neighbors, I have no doubt that parking is the number one priority. I assume we gotta solve that. <laughs> um, it's great, you listen to the community, you listen to people like me and my neighbors, so please do solve that. Um, <clears throat> adding on to it, my mic I had on, um, we finished our public input process on August 20th. To keep up with your timeline, we did a little bit of a quick scramble in our process to be able to enable us to write the letter we wrote to you on August 23rd, which said to you guys that we firmly, strongly want to be a part of the mixed use development at Tully's. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna put a whole lot more time and effort in the next couple weeks into rolling all that together. We will share more of that with you on September 17th or 18th or a date to be determined. Um, and there'll be a full report. And I would actually say not as, just as importantly, if not more important than sharing with you, we're gonna share with the whole community. We'll tell them what they told us, what we think we heard from them, that's what we spent the last three months doing. Um, one example, we asked the community, what do you think the benefit of a central location for the arts would be? And 71% said they strongly agree or agree with that statement, and 17% said they strongly disagree or disagree with that statement. So 71 to 17%. So we'll present a lot more of that when we get together with you guys for study session. Um, as we said in the letter, we would ask you and your considerations to put more weighting on the art, arts and culture spaces part of your evaluation. Um, and overall, it seems like such an awesome opportunity to not only meet goal number one, which is to provide parking, but to add on a significant community benefit and involve a private developer and leverage your sound transit dollars and leverage the dollars from a private developer. So the three parts of that potential mixed use seem like a real potential home run for the community and we want to be a part of it, thanks. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm John Conrad. I live at uh, 9320 Southeast 36th Street. I'd like to thank the city staff for the difficult work they did in finding the $1.23 million in service cuts and the $1 million from contingency funds necessary to balance the 2019-2020 budget if Proposition 1 fails to pass in November. It's sad to see a concrete plan for the dismantling of our city. The outcome was broadly predicted when Initiative 747 was on the ballot in 2007. The citizens of Mercer Island chose to re reject 747, but ultimately the state legislature enacted it. Limiting city revenue growth from property taxes to 1% with no adjustments for inflation will eventually require all Washington cities to seek a levy lid lift. 
or face cuts like the ones we've, we will see tonight. I'm very sad to see that we will be forced to drastically reduce the geriatric services provided by YFS. Our seniors love the YFS staff and the services they provide. The cuts to fire and police will be felt by everyone. My wife and I could have relocated anywhere in the Puget Sound area as we moved here six years ago. We chose Mercer Island because YFS made it the best place to raise our kids. If Prop 1 fails and we lose two elementary school YFS counselors, the island will suffer. The YFS counselors are preventing problems and making our kids better members of their schools. Stretching the existing counselors across schools will make it nearly impossible for the counselors to schedule meetings with parents and our children will pay the price. For me, Prop 1 will increase my property taxes about a dollar a day. Seeing what you as city councilors will have to do if Prop 1 fails, I am truly saddened. I do not understand how anyone can stand in opposition to this proposition. Seeing members of this community post signs calling for the dismantling of the city really shocks me. The levy lift will increase my property taxes by less than 3%. I'm going to pause just a moment. City Attorney, are we in a good place? I think this is very borderline on campaigning. So City Attorney, I'd look for your guidance in terms of whether it should continue or not. Um, That's fine. I'd just like to ask the speaker to please not be advocating or taking any position with regard to the Prop 1 ballot measure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, you know, looking at what you're going to be reviewing in the budget tonight, um, I know it must be really painful. I know you, you, you live on the island, and I want to say that I appreciate the, the hard work that's gone into trying to figure out a solution to the problem. And um, that's it. Thank you. Do we have any more public appearances? If folks could line up, that would be super helpful. Welcome. Hi. My name is Sarah. I live on 84th Avenue Southeast. I had the opportunity to observe two of the three CAG meetings and two of the open houses held for citizens. The city manager and director of finance led presentations on the city's financial condition. What struck me was the use of the statements, we are a lean organization and finding efficiencies is in our DNA. Typically when people make these statements, they also boast of their savings and enhanced metrics. For example, they'll say we reduce the amount of time it takes to process a permit request from a 30-day average to a 21-day average, saving 250000 in labor costs. The statements that we hear here on Mercer Island are that our auditors, including consultants and the Washington State auditors, commenting that they can't provide an assessment because there are no documented procedures, tracking mechanisms, or measures in place. Lean organizations talk about delivering value to their customers from the customer perspective, eliminating waste from process and respecting the people doing the work and continuously improving what the organization does. Employees can identify waste in their processes quite readily. Talk to your employees. An indicator for one of the things of waste, skills, may be that we're spending 3.5 million in consulting and other professional services. An example of overproduction may be scheduling classes at the Mercer Island Community and Event Center that no one attends. Examples of waiting are planning a job to remove debris and storm drains with two trucks and four men. You have one idle truck and three men twiddling their thumbs. An example of inventory is the project at Groveland Park and the road work on 40th. Start your projects, finish your projects. Another option that the finance director and I discussed was the voice of the customer. You got a smattering of what that meant for the Mercer Island Biannual Survey and with attendance at meetings like this. What the residents of Mercer Island are telling you that is that over the last three surveys, their satisfaction with your services are deteriorating. This tells you that the 22.5 FTE employees who have been added since 2011 are not A, providing the services that your customers value, and B, throwing people at the problem is not achieving the results you want. I recommend that the city focuses on essential city for services, primarily safety and infrastructure. 
When I hear the proposed cuts, the visual that I'm left with is that of a wolf pack. The city intends to prey on the elderly and children and infi inflict pain on families. The city budget is about prioritizing safety of which fire, police, and mental health are part of and infrastructure. We know that you're proposing a 30 million levy for sewer and water, essentially doubling the existing city up? tax rate in a year or two. The conclusions that can be drawn with this city proposal is that you are either trying to incite fear amongst residents or you're grossly negligent. Neither option is compelling. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Bring it down. Good evening, Council. I'm Sharon Perez of 3404 79th Avenue Southeast. And um, I would like to tell you a little bit more about what we heard listening to the community in the last three months. I am an Islander, a mom, a volunteer, and part of Team MICA. And I want to say that we talked to residents, neighbors, people involved in the community who are very excited about the quality of life on our island. And they're engaged and they're excited and looking forward to having a multi-generational gathering place to experience and enjoy our community around the arts. And I think that this is related to everything we're doing right now because it's all about investing in our community. And it was very encouraging to see how many people came to participate in all of the listening sessions because they care so much about our community and its future. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public appearances? Seeing none, appearances are now closed. The next item of business is the consent calendar, which contains payables, payroll, and AB 5465, the Lincoln Landing, Lincoln Landing Stormwater and Park Improvement Project Appropriation Request. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's been firsted and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, consent calendar is approved. Excuse me, Mayor. Could I get the first and second on that? I, I believe it was second. Bruce and Selena. Thank you. So we now move to regular business, um, and the first item is AB 5459. Finalize the RFQ for transit, commuter parking, and public-private mixed-use development project on the Tully's Parcel 12 site. Welcome City Manager Julie Underwood. And if I could ask um, Bob Stowe, our consultant on this project, to please join me. I'm excited to bring before you a uh, second draft for the request for qualifications for us to hopefully partner with a very well-qualified developer to build a transit commuter parking and um, mixed-use development on the Tully's and Parcel 12 site. As you know, the problem we're solving is to, to provide more commuter parking for our residents, especially when the light rail station opens in 2023. In our recent citizen survey, clearly our residents have noted they are not satisfied with the availability of commuter parking 
and they identified uh, commuter parking as their top transportation priority. You might recall in early June, you approved the purchase and sale agreement um, with the Tully's property owners, and we are embarking on that due diligence period now, and um, you reviewed the draft RFQ back on July 17th. Um, again, why are we uh, wanting to proceed with an RFQ process now? We really believe our residents wanna know what's going to be on that site beyond commuter parking. So we think engaging a qualified partner can help us in that um, process. We also want to understand what are the full costs for the project. Again, bringing in a qualified developer will help us with that. They can also better inform the due diligence process. And of course, we believe um, while 2023 seems like so far in the future, it's going to be here before we know it. And we really want to get going on this important project. Um, again, want to remind you, this is the uh, site location and in the center of the I-90 uh, corridor there is the light rail. So it is a great spot for a mixed use transit uh, commuter parking. Um, recall that you have settlement funds to go towards this project. The settlement uh, agreement provided over $10 million, um, 4.4 of that is for commuter parking. Recall that Sound Transit will provide 49%, the city has to fund the 51%. Why is that important? Because that allows us to create a model whereby residents can get a preferential access to this parking. And then, well, how's the city gonna fund their 51%? Well, we believe leveraging that land um, can provide the capital needed to construct the parking. So a, our goal is to find a well-qualified partner that would construct the, the underground parking and in exchange uh, provide the air rights for them to develop, of course, according to the town center code. Um, and we envision um, perhaps some type of condo arrangement, but no matter what, that the city would um, really retain ownership of the parking. Julie? Yes, sir. The, they would, uh, uh, we would retain ownership of the 100 or more commuter spaces, not the totality of the parking if they built 300. I'm sorry, that's correct. That right? Okay, thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. Um, and so we believe by assembling the Tully's parcel and the city's parcel 12, we can provide over 35,000 square feet of development potential, and again, right next to our future light rail station. As you know, um, during the due diligence process, we are going through a comprehensive plan amendment and rezone for parcel 12. Again, without that, there is no ability really for us to leverage um, and, and provide a mixed use project while, while parcel 12 would allow us to build parking, it would limit us to parking. So that is going through, and I believe, as I noted in the city manager's report, that is um, on the planning commission agenda for tomorrow evening. All right, I'm gonna ask um, Bob to step in and talk a little bit more about public-private uh, partnership benefits. Thank you, Julie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's great to be with you again tonight. As the city manager had mentioned, there are some great benefits associated with this public-private partnership. None the least, or not the least of which, is, is the potential to obtain 100 or more public parking spaces for um, uh, Mercer Island use. Um, this site that we're looking at is within very close proximity to your proposed light rail station, within 500 feet. Um, it's one of two sites that have been identified that could accommodate um, commuter parking for light rail use. And of course, the objective is to obtain public parking for the least possible cost uh, for your taxpayers. There are two components within the RFQ of which we will be evaluating those who who respond to the city's request. Um, those include uh, the team qualifications and experience, um, things such as the experience of all the team members, their relevant um, experience <coughs> related to public-private partnerships, their financial capability um, to perform 
um, the tasks that we're asking them to, to demonstrate. That is weighted at 60%. Um, the remaining percentage of evaluation criteria will be based on the project vision and the preliminary uh, concept and proposal. We want to understand the developer's approach, um, the types of uses that are being proposed on the site, whether that's retail, residential, parking, or other uses. Um, we'll want to include a number of, or we, the RFQ does include a number of, of community preferences that we've identified we want to see on the site. Those include uh, community benefits, things that will have a long-lasting and long-term measurable community benefit for Mercer Island residents, um, and include impactful projects, proposal will have a lasting impact on nearby properties throughout the entire downtown uh, based on the design as well as the function um, of the proposed development. The timeliness, we wanna make sure that projects um, that are positioned to move forward in the near term um, and commit to some significant milestones that we lay out um, in a future agreement with the uh, uh, prospective development team. Partnerships, we want respondents um, with the demonstrated capacity to partner uh, with the city and a proven ability to develop uh, high quality projects. And then finally, uh, sustainability. I think I may have, um, partnership, sorry. Partnership uh, respondents, uh, we want them to partner with the city and what's in the RFQ but not in, our, our, not in the PowerPoint, excuse me, is sustainability. We wanna make sure that um, we have best practices for sustainable developments within the RFQ. I mentioned community benefits. Um, community benefits include, of course, the underground parking. Um, we're targeting at least 100 or more spaces. Public open space um, is important. Um, attractive and functional open space will be important as we evaluate um, uh, proposals. A well-designed um, um, integration of, of the project that enhances the, the Greta um, Hackett Outdoor Sculpture and Gallery into the design. Um, art and cultural space, we heard about that this evening when we went to look for proposals that include art and culture components that enrich the quality um, of life amenities for Mercer Island residents. And then finally, um, um, housing diversity. Um, the RFQ does note that there have been uh, residents that have expressed a desire to purchase residential units in the town center, um, as well as provide for workforce housing. The selection process will be narrowed once we uh, receive all the respondents, uh, staff, as well as uh, a committee will evaluate those proposals based on the criteria I've just mentioned. Uh, we'll narrow that, that, that group down to a semifinalist of three or four um, development teams. Those semifinalists will go through a formal interview process with the staff and the committee. Um, that semifinalist group will also present that information in a presentation to the Mercer Island community. The interview panel will regroup, filing those, pre filing those presentations um, and informal interviews to narrow it down to two semifinalists that then will be brought to the city council um, for your consideration to select the preferred um, development team and after which the city then will start negotiation, exclusive negotiations with a specific development team leading to a binding um, development agreement to move forward with the mixed use development. This is a calendar or a schedule or timeline that um, I just went through. Um, we would propose that the RFQ be released at the end of the week. Um, that will proceed for the next five or six weeks in which the teams will develop their proposals, um, submit those to the city, and we anticipate having a council um, interviews in October um, and then council considering the top two finalists at the beginning of November, leading to uh, exclusive negotiating agreement and binding agreement um, early next year. And I'll turn it back over to the city manager for the recommendation. And council, I look for your approval of the RFQ and selection process this evening so we can kick off this important step in this um, project timeline. And of course, any questions or any changes? The council, questions? Bruce? It was gonna be a question, but uh, I, I took a quick look at the packet. And uh, Bob, you, you laid out a number of requirements. Um, you didn't mention uh, the connectedness of town center to light rail station and the, the walkway at the, um, uh, within the Greta Hackett. Uh, outdoor sculpture garden, which 
Um, the, the fact that you didn't mention it sort of perked my ears up because I thought, oh, that's really important. But as I look at the packet, I see that it is very much uh, listed here. And I do consider it to be an essential element of this, trying to create integration of those uh, different and you know, currently sort of, uh, separate pieces, but to be creating a, a natural flow for all of them. And, and the fact that it's here means that I'm just commenting rather than questioning. You're exactly right. My, my, uh, it was just simply my um, uh, uh, mistake in not mentioning that during the presentation. It's certainly a value within the RFQ. Can we have Celine then Dave? Bob, maybe you can walk me through how a submitter might look at this RFQ and decide would they be more inclined to put 100 condos into proposal versus 100 workforce housing units or 50 condos and 50 workforce housing units. You know, is, is it, does one have more weight than another? Does having two versus one uh, of community, one of the kind of listed community benefit items carry some sort of extra weight? How does somebody, thinking about what they might propose, navigate that, that matrix? As, as we move forward um, with the RFQ, we're going to be developing a criteria evaluation sheet that then weights the individual elements that we've listed um, in the RFQ to provide respondents a better understanding of how the city might consider their proposal. Whether or not it's 100 or 50 will largely be uh, simply an exercise of can they support the parking necessary for 100 or, 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 or 50 units. But in terms of whether or not uh, a respondent is able to sort of check the box of a number of community benefits, I would expect that respondent to have a higher weight and a higher score than those who weren't able to, to do as many. And you've heard from this evening um, from a MICA representative asking for one of the community weights to be valued higher than others. <coughs> I guess I'd clarify, did that answer your question or maybe I, did, I didn't? Well. It, well, it begs another question. So if somebody came and offered 90 parking spots and workforce housing and somebody else offered 110 parking spots and no workforce housing, oh, I, is there I guidance in the proposal uh, to, to select the top two? I believe there will be. Um, certainly the, what's been a priority for the city is to demonstrate or have developers demonstrate how they can su support the city's parking demands. Um, associated with light rail. And so someone who's able to provide 110 spaces versus 90 with a workforce housing component, I would um, suspect that the higher value and the higher weight should go to the public parking component. And it would, Council, it would probably be helpful to understand, I mean, mind you, our, um, some of the community benefits really just came directly from our comp plan. So it's, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise to you. But obviously, there, um, you might actually weight one thing over another. It certainly would help us in developing the evaluation sheet to hear your feedback about what you prioritize. Of course, I, as your city manager, I prioritize, I, I like um, condos, I like ownership, and so, um, that helps the city, I think, financially, I, you know, that sort of thing. I might, but maybe you um, value workforce housing because obviously there's an affordable housing crisis in the region. So um, probably would be helpful to get some initial input on how we draft that evaluation sheet. Dave? Uh, so you answered much of my question, but Bob, I'll go to a sort of an overly broad question, uh, if you don't mind. You've been through this um, on several different occasions with several different projects. What, what do you anticipate that process looking like on the front end? Do you think that we'll get uh, two applicants, 10 applicants? Is that winnowing process a, a, a mighty one, or do you, do you find it's a, a fairly select group that's able to fit the bill? I would like to tell you that I think we would um, get 10 or 20 different respondents, but you know, the people are very busy right now in terms of the development um, industry. And so I'd be delighted if we had five or six very well qualified respondents that we can then narrow down to two or three really good uh, teams that are able to, to meet the uh, prerequisites that we've laid out in the RFQ. Maybe just a follow up question. In your experience, if you have a, you narrow it down to two, let's say, which 
will be our process and one falls out for whatever reason it's not viable for them it's not viable for us do you do you find that you're able to uh, pull back some of the original applicants or do those ships tend to sail off in your you know, it depends on the time frame in which if you're entering into negotiations with a development team and that uh, negotiations is prolonged, it may be that your number two development team is no longer interested or is no longer capable of performing that same work because they've accepted another job somewhere else yeah. or they're busy. So it really depends on the time frame. Um, we're entering into our um, exclusive negotiations with a development team. We want that to, to indicate the seriousness of, of, of being able to create a partnership but if we're not able to do that through those exclusive negotiations within a within a limited time frame we want to have the ability to move to our second choice yeah okay thanks for the patient answer so tom then bruce uh question and just a clarification this rfq suggests that they will be condos and i just want to make sure that i'm reading that correctly because for last four years that I've been involved with the community, everybody's asking for condos, not more apartments, and people that are aging out of their homes want to still have ownership in units in the community. So is that, did I read that correctly? This RFQ is for condos specifically. The RFQ is anticipating a condo structure in terms of an ownership with respect to the uh, parking uh, facility underground and then above ground being that owned by the developer. Um, but it does give community preference to home ownership. Okay. But it doesn't require if condos in the sense so of this a single family or could end up in a real estate investment trust like the majority of our properties in the town center and be rented out as apartments. Then. That that is that is a possibility. That is correct. Okay. Is there a way that if we found a developer we liked, I don't know who Howard S. Wright selling, we approached them in the RFQ or RFP proposal and said what we want are X condos, here's the design criteria, they build to the specs that they're provided, that those condos can be pre-sold to fund the project and the city would still own the retail space and the art center space and the 100 parking places. Because at 600,000 to 1.2 million per condo, you could generate a lot of revenue and it, turn it into a different type of partnership. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. We're not trying to limit the applicant pool or the development proposals by determining at this point whether or not it should be condominiums for the residential component. Um, we've indicated that it could be both um, for rent as well as for sale, um, but there is a strong RA preference for home ownership. And can we be very specific in that I, I, I really, more? well, what happens is we get real estate investment trusts. And we did that, or I did that study a few years ago about the, the valuation of the buildings. They sit in those trusts and they don't turn over. Condos turn over every 10 years and you have that predictable excise tax coming in. So I think there's a financial benefit to the city from a revenue perspective to have them be condominiums. I think there's a benefit to our community to have them be condominiums because people want to stay here and they don't have a lot of condo ownership type options. And then thirdly, I think the design opportunities are uh, a lot more uh, uh, favorable to blend with the arts retail uh, design perspective. I would say that you know really the market forces are going to limit your applicant pools who are willing to invest in a condominium, you know, for sale product. Um, I mean, there's a reason why the you, most of the, the housing multifamily development that you see today is in the for rent um, market area, um, given you know this state's um, uh, condominium regulations and the additional expense. Not, not that that wouldn't change in the future, and I think you're starting to see um, the multifamily uh, for rent product starting to slow down a bit, and so that would you'd expect that your condominium market will then accelerate or at least become stronger. Um, but I don't know if I'd want to propose that at this point um, until we receive the proposals. That may very well be a discussion we could hold with the selected or the preferred developer about the type of products um, that he wants to put forward um, if it's a residential component, which is assumed will, will be. Bruce. Yeah, 
you, um, Julia or Bob, mentioned uh, uh, the, the question of whether council wanted to provide more input towards a qualification sheet, I think you called it. Um, and I'm trying to, I guess I'd like to understand is, are you actually asking us to sort of off the cuff opine tonight looking at this as to how we'd like to prioritize these things? Or are you suggesting that that might be a uh, separate conversation that, that is had? Because, uh, and, and sort of jumping toward that, I'm a little bit concerned that we could give you off the cuff ideas, but I'm not sure that that would be as thoughtfully uh, <coughs> developed as it ought to be before it actually finds its way to from from our mouths to paper um, the other thing related to that is given Bob your your suggestion that you expect there might be uh, a handful of, of qualified applicants coming in I'm less concerned about the qualification sheet than I would be if you told me we were expecting a hundred or 200 applicants and there really was a desperate need to winnow that down in, in some very clear way before we even began to look at them in much more detail. But given that it, we're anticipating quite a small number, I, I would imagine that we'll look quite closely at all of them and uh, there'll be an opportunity for conversation then about how they uh, rise or fall based on what we're, what we're seeing. So. Uh, long way around saying my inclination is to hesitate towards trying to give you much in the way of um, input for what a qualification sheet would look like because it feels like we might get ourselves uh, a little bit funny with, with uh, giving you ideas and then you can't quite figure out how strongly to take those or, or not or we end up kind of wrapped around an axle here arguing about whether one should be higher than another and uh, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to go there if that's sure. what you're thinking. No, thank you I and mean, I would love to be able to tell you that we, we'd receive 10 or 20 um, respondents certainly it won't be in the hundreds and if we and again if we re receive five very well qualified uh, responses I would I would think that would be a, a, a you know a good process for us. So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and just sure. chime in briefly because clearly what we have here is uh, the need for some sort of motion that would approve the request for qualifications and selection process. Equally, Julie, you've mentioned this, this concept of a waiting sheet or criteria. We know that there's a motion that you need. Can you articulate a little more specifically um, regarding this, this, this concept of waiting? Because I too tend to fall where, where Bruce is, is I think that we could um, find ourselves in a bit of a a, a tangled web if we were to sit here tonight and try to stack rank in essence a series of potential community benefits particularly at this last minute so can you help us understand more specifically what it is you need or what you're hoping for mayor I would say looking if you look at the RFQ and the section um, identified as community benefit on page 13 that obviously is our attempt at kind of providing what we consider um, really things the council and the community would want to look for in a, um, a concept. I think the question I'd love to hear answered to this evening is the request from Micah regarding whether or not um, the council feels strongly one way or the other of kind of say moving that arts and culture a little bit higher or not. So I think that's a, um, a request, a question, and I certainly would welcome your feedback on that as far as that would help us design a evaluation sheet that then we could provide to the developers when we have our um, pre-submission conference and tours. And I think the more clear we are on what we'd like to see on that site, the better. Just, yeah. just want to add on, Mayor, to, to the city manager's comments. There are five community um, preferences identified in the RFQ. Parking, of course, is one of those. Parking is also a prerequisite in the proposal as well. Um, and so what might be helpful, just picking up from the city manager's comments, is just a priority, prioritization of those community benefits. If parking is priority number one, is the cultural um, arts 
um, amenities, priority number two, and, and so forth. That might be uh, helpful as we sort of go through a scoring uh, sheet for for each per, for each respondent. I think I would just start by saying that parking shouldn't even be optional. I would almost put it in a separate paragraph that says, you know, maximum commuter parking necessary, required, whatever strong language it is, because this is ultimately, you know, as has been even reflected in the um, different comments from the public, this is ultimately a public parking project. So to me, to see that as a community benefit and even potentially considered equivalent to some of these other benefits is somewhat misleading. So that, that would be just some of my immediate feedback. Council, um, that would leave for remaining bullet points, so to speak. Is there an appetite, a sense that this evening that we would want to go into a waiting or I'm, I'm seeing, Dave, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, yeah I wanted to say, say two things. Back to uh, the original comment I was going to make is I would encourage us to allow the net to be cast as widely as possible and then let's do our uh, filtering process once we get applicants. So the, the worst case scenario is that we somehow engineer a preconceived solution today that um, becomes distasteful to potential applicants and we don't see them, so uh, allowing that. I, I did uh, see the same thing that, that the mayor saw, which is why do we not put parking as a requirement? Is that sort of the whole? Yeah, I think it is. Here. I think that was the intent. It's it's included in both places. And as as I look at the community benefits, you could you could take that community benefit parking, uh, roll it up to the um, uh, requirement team qualification sections where we talk about a conceptual uh, preliminary estimate number of commuter parking spaces, and then indicate the city envision an underground parking facility of a hundred or more parking okay. spaces. Okay, yeah, but so I, I it just puts it into a, the, the other category of, yeah. of of waiting. Got it. Got it. And then um, to the MICA question, is there a is there a concern? I don't know if we want to hear from uh, MICA since they're here. Is there a concern that that position on the preferences scale makes it not as doesn't make it pop to a potential applicant as much as it should or I, I'm asking you all, but I don't know if. I, I, I think I'd like to hear from the city manager. Well, um, you know, I think part of this is w putting it out there and seeing if the market will come back and support something like that. Um, we have t talked with a developer that has expressed an interest in supporting an arrangement like that. Obviously, the city has said many times to Paul Shoemaker that the city has no money for the MICA portion of that project. And obviously, I'm assuming a developer would be looking you know, to ensure that whoever comes and is part of this project has the capital. Yep. So, yep, yep, yep. yeah. Uh, just to close that out, I, I think I'm glad that we have um, the preference for arts and culture in there. Obviously, that's a direct uh, point at MICA, and I just want to make sure, you know, certainly we're, we're not providing money for the project, but if there's, if there's more that we can do in terms of our support, this is the time to do it, and we've, we've included in the RFQ, and we, we shouldn't go in that tepidly, so if there's more that, that would help that cause, we can, this would be the time to maybe have that discussion. Okay. Salim? So it kind of goes back to what I asked earlier, which is, you know, how does how does a submitter look at these um, preferences and make some decisions about what they might include and might not? And I think one of the ways that they might do that is just this this council recording, right? I think any serious bidder is going to come back to this. They're going to look at proceedings tonight, and they're going to get a sense of how the council felt about these preferences. I, I do think that parking needs to be in a stack of its own, right? That, that any proposal that that is put forth more parking spots than another is going to get deferential treatment. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be selected, but I think th th there should be a strong message in the RFQ that says this is a parking first proposal, always has been, and, and that's our intent. Uh, I, I do look at the site and I look at the assemblage of the Tully's property, parcel 12, and uh, the rights of ways, and then I, I know some of the discussions that are occurring in terms of uh, constructing a gateway and using some of the surface areas to to have plazas and open spaces so I get all that uh, and some of that is a bit kind of under under discussion 
I do think that I would give a higher preference to something that involved a space for the arts because I think that we might leave some juice on the table by saying uh, it's only about parking and not giving any, any additional deference to a space for the arts. It does a couple things for the community. Uh, it does solve a problem we can't solve with zoning. Uh, we're not going to make a code in town center that says uh, build a beautiful building and include an arts center. It's never going to happen. Uh, we can do that with, uh, with affordable housing. We can do that with uh, public open plazas and some of the other incentives with uh, mid-block connections. But I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where we could say put an arts center into just a purely uh, private development. So it's, it's an opportunity lost if we don't provide guidance to submitters to give that additional deference. I certainly would. Um, I would almost take this list and just stack rank it as it is moving parking to a requisite and saying uh, we would give, I would give person, I would give more preference to uh, pedestrian bicycle connections and then well-designed integration and gateway uh, characteristics, arts and cultural events and spaces and then housing diversity in that order. That would be my preference. Uh, if, if that's the level of guidance that you need to kind of hit the ground running with the matrix that's gonna develop as the ground game develops, you know, maybe that's enough. Uh, but I think certainly my public comments would give guidance to any submitter that I would like to see that as part of this proposal, a place for the arts, because I think that uh, there's plenty of opportunity to put parking into that site, and I think there is some facilities opportunity there, there as well. Bruce? I would support what Salima suggested. Um, I think that Parking is off the list because it was the essential element to begin. I think the next two are uh, absolutely necessary to have things function as they should function. But then beyond that, trying to get an art center, I, I would place at a higher priority than trying to get housing diversity there. So that, that would be my inclination. You know, as a, as a bullet list, it, it's not apparent that it's ranked, right? It's just uh, equal points things but as Salim suggests giving at least some I mean then you immediately get into the you know the what's the yeah what's mm -hmm. the relative uh, importance of them but, but giving somewhat greater weight to them in that order makes sense to me Tom then Dave um, I agree with uh, uh, Governor Mayor Bassett's um, the way he categorized those and I would strike the housing diversity I'd like to put more emphasis on being very specific to condominium on ownership. Um, it, it might be last on the list, but um, the, the rest of it, I, it the, the housing diversity, I just don't see how that would work in the model. Um, Julie made another comment um, earlier about how you've already met with developers, and I think some of the council members have as well. Um, I think that we should extend the RFQ bidding process to give an opportunity for others who haven't had an opportunity to meet with the city or city council, uh, a fair opportunity to really evaluate the, the proposal. Yeah, um, I just want to clarify your point about housing diversity. Uh, when you asked Bob Stowe the question about does this preclude multifamily, is there from a rental perspective? I don't think this bullet, per se, is what is allowing that. Th this is giving, I think, some priority to condo ownership and workforce housing, not any priority to rental units. Those he's saying are allowed, but not, I, I don't I think, reflected it. by this bullet. So I, I get it. What I'm trying to say <laughs> is I very prescriptively wanted to call out that these would be um, units that would be sold as condominium complexes. Um, the, the real estate investment trust model um, is not something that I'm supportive of. If, it, if that's the way that we have to go, then we have to go that way. But I know uh, one of our representatives, Tana Sen, is working on the, the legislation that addresses some of the insurance issues that came out of the construction industry in the 1980s. And, and I understand why people built um, the apartment models over the condominiums, but I, I really think that we could capture another benefit for our community and for our city if we move to make it more explicit that there's a benefit to condominium uh, structures. 
because I think Dave, yeah. Dave, uh, and then I'm going to try to work us into yeah, some I sort of actually finalization and, here. I was going to try and help us do that too. I think um, to speak to Tom, I think you would. Um, we'll have that opportunity to make those decisions later once we have applicants. I think you would um, unnecessarily narrow the pool of applicants by what could be 70%. And I think that's a that's a dangerous position for us to be in when you say if we have to go that way, we will. But if we say it's only, uh, we'll only allow condo developments, then you may end up with no applicants at all. And I think that's a dangerous position for us to be in. So we can, we can uh, make those choices as we have those applicants. If we have a condo applicant versus an apartment applicant, if that's important, we can do that at that time. But if, um, back to the arts thing, that was my original comment, was I, I think all we're trying to say, hopefully I don't, I don't want to represent everybody here, but I think all we're trying to say is we want to be uh, clear to the applicants that an, uh, the, the developer, the developer's ability to execute on an art center as part of the project is important to the council. I think that's what we're hearing from the majority. I don't. If you disagree, well, speak. I think I think that was a good start at, at summary because what I, I was just going to try to go through and articulate what I've heard, and hopefully people can chime in the extent to which I'm accurate or inaccurate, and again representing the majority of voices here, versus that parking does get removed and put into its own hyper mandatory category if that's if that's possible. Um, the remaining four bullet points: public open spaces, well designed integration arts and cultural event and spaces and housing diversity. What I have heard and I would agree with is basically that prioritization. I personally would. And I think that seems to be fairly consistent here. So just taking a pause there, Julie, does that provide you with what you need in that sense? Um, we are rem we're left talking a little bit more about what exactly does housing diversity mean um, but I want to just weigh in momentarily on the arts and cultural events and spaces bullet point here. One of the things that I appreciated was that it was first of all included. I also felt that the initial bullet point as drafted is, is a little bit general and a little bit vague and I tried to imagine if I was a developer who was not particularly well versed in the conversations the communities had, what does that mean? Now we all know they can go do and they should go do some serious research but the extent to which any council member has any cause for concern, I would suggest that we just borrow some of the language that they put in their letter, um, such that it says inclusion of arts, uh, let me get this right, arts and cultural components such as arts performances, education and collaboration venues, which is actually what came from their letter, so that it's quite specific fellow council members, any concern with that modification to the wording? Okay, so then that, le uh, yeah. You were looking at me, so yes, I'm okay with the wording on the arts part. Okay, so then we're at the housing diversity. Um, Tom has a strong preference for seeing some element in there that focuses on ownership, shall we say. Um, which doesn't necessarily exclude the workforce housing component of it. Fellow council members, Dave, you have said you're, you would like to keep it uh, broader in general. I, I support Tom's intent, but I, th I prefer Dave's approach with the cast a wide net in, the, uh, in these early stages and then bring this in as part of the conversation later. Okay, Celine. So I, I'm going to stick with, I think he's misinterpreted the bullet, and it's fine as it is. And if I was a submitter, I would read that bullet, and I would take it to mean a condo. If I built a condo, that that would be something that I uh, had some preference. Or equal preference would be workforce housing. That's how I read that bullet. I don't read that bullet to mean if I build a building, sell it to a REIT, and then make it apartments, that that's what that's talking about. But I don't think it's a constraint. I think it's just a preference. It, it, is that true, Bob? Because if if we're giving preferential treatment to condos and workforce housing, I'm okay. But um, <coughs> most of the developers that I've worked with in my construction history prefer the apartments because it turns into a cash cow and they can unload it into a trust. But if 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 the way that Salim's interpreting it 
is correct. I'm okay with the language. It includes the preferences for home ownership, and it also includes workforce housing. Now, workforce housing could mean, um, you know, certain percentage of the AMI for both rental units or home ownership units. And in our evaluation criteria, a developer that came in and said, these are going to be owner-occupied units. They would receive a preference. They would preference. receive a preference. That's then correct. Deputy Mayor, I'm okay with it. Okay, well in that case, um, it sounds like we have reached consensus. So Julie, Bob, team, are you, do you have what you need? Yes, Mayor, as Apart far as from the motion. As far as the timeline goes, I I think in consulting um, consulting with Bob, I think we feel um, let's keep with our timeline and then extend it if we if it's materializing that we're not getting a lot of interest, if you don't mind. That would be the recommendation. Well, I, I guess I'd look at it a different way. Um, Julie, and that's um, perception can become reality, and I just, I think it's better to extend it a month so that the month that has been invested in conversations with others gives that other person a month to catch up, but uh, council one of four. I'm just gonna ask council if there's any consensus, any additional interest from any other council members to extend the process. <coughs> Not seeing none. I, I mean, not and since none. Not, not well, seeing any, that was, that was a and good just, one. Um, since July, when you had your first RFQ conversation, we started having calls from interested developers. So they're aware and, uh, and I probably have seen at least the draft at this point. So I guess if council's agreeable, let's stay, stick with the timeline and then adjust if, if, you, if we come back and we don't have that great a pool. Ready for a motion? Excuse okay. me. Yeah. Uh, I would move to approve the request for qualifications and selection process for the proposed transit commuter parking and public private mixed use project on the Tully's parcel 12 site, including the mandatory element of parking and the additional prioritization of an arts uh, and culture center. Maybe it's just to take the remaining preference items yeah. and give them uh, additional weight. Well, the stack, the rankings, the ranking, the stack as ranking. In, in the order in which they yeah. appear. Yeah. Can yeah. I say as amended by Salim, or do I need to say that all over yes. again? Yes, I got it. Oops. As, as amended, amended by Salim. <laughs> yes, need a second. Okay. Second. Okay. So we have a motion. We have amended motion. We have a second to the amended motion. So now we're voting on. Not the exactly. That's motion. not a formal amendment. But I, I, okay. I don't okay. Because when you seconded it after Celine had seconded it, I. I didn't second. No, I don't think Celine okay. seconded it. All right. Then my misunderstanding. All right. So I'm all in favor. Signify by well, nine. Well, let's, let's, Wait. let's make sure the city clerk is okay with what we've got at this point. Are you? You you, you didn't finish the motion. I mean, he made a recommendation, but it wasn't a formal second. Okay. I mean, I don't think you have an amendment. I think you just have a motion and a second on the floor. Yes. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, motion passed. Thanks. Excuse me? I just wanted to clarify in terms of what just happened. I want to clarify that um, the main motion was not amended. However, um, the motion as made, I think it was clear before it was made that there was council direction about the priorities, and I'm sorry, the preferences and how they're stack ranked. So I believe that that will be captured. I just wanted the council to have assurance that your direction feedback was heard, even though it wasn't captured in the motion. <laughs> Good. No, you didn't do a <laughs> okay, so with that, I think we're just gonna try again on the next AB, which is um, Agenda Bill 5462, the 2019-2020 Biennial Budget Council Direction. Julie and Chip.
Council this evening. I am seeking uh, confirmation on the council direction for the 2019-2020 biennial budget in light of the contingency fund target recommendation made by management partners. In your packet, um, regrettably, I provide some preliminary service level reductions for your early consideration. Tonight's discussion is not intended for a detailed budget discussion, so if you um, could please hold off. We have uh, about six meetings this fall devoted to the budget and the CIP. Um, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Chip Quarter, our Assistant City Manager, Finance Director, to um, highlight uh, so far the direction we've heard and to review some of the uh, uh, structural deficit numbers with you. Good evening. So as a reminder, at your mini planning se session back on June 9th, uh, you gave us direction, prudent direction, to assume no levy load lift in building the preliminary budget. Uh, we also, uh, the direction received at that time was to use our one-time fund balances in various places to uh, fund services temporarily over the biennium or to otherwise and, and to minimize service level reductions. Other key assumptions included 2% uh, growth in property tax, that's 1% from new construction, 1% optional voted by the council. It assumes the beautification fund is combined with the general fund, which nets $225,000 in net revenue uh, for the, for the uh, general fund beginning in 19. It assumes no utility tax increases, tax rate increases, and no B and O tax rate increases in the coming six year period. That was the direction received back then. And uh, July 10th, uh, when Steve Toller from Management Partners uh, presented to the council uh, regarding uh, the forecast, by the city, he also mentioned that the city's contingency fund target at 10% of general fund expenditures is unusually low, and a best practice is to be at two months of general fund expenditures, which equals about 17%. Um, I should just mention that the, the, the current policy or target for a contingency fund at 10% equals about 1.2 months versus two, uh, versus two months of general fund expenditures. Staff is recommending on, under this scenario, which assumes no levy lid lift, uh, that we build toward that 17% target over time. We have enough money to get to the uh, one and a half month target, which equals 12 and a half percent of general fund expenditures. Uh, we think that is prudent, and that also leaves us a chunk of change to help balance the budget uh, in, in 19 and 20, if needed. As a reminder, the contingency fund is our rainy day fund. It serves multiple purposes, but primarily when there's an economic downturn, like during the Great Recession, we tap that fund. When there's a natural catastrophe, if something unforeseen happens, for example, a lawsuit that's not covered by WCIA, it would be funded by the city. This is a place that you turn to. In terms of the biennial budget for 19 and 20, the strategy to meet this target uh, and to balance the budget is threefold. One, we would use $911,000 uh, to raise uh, uh, the target from 10% to 12.5% or one and a half months. We would use almost $2 million in one-time resources uh, to balance the budget in 19 and 20. And really what this is, this is a temporary bridge is what that is, right? It just buys you time. If a level of the fails, it gives you the chance to uh, stabilize services as much as possible and to go back out to the community in 2020 or 21. And this also requires $1.2 million in round numbers and service level reductions to balance the budget, which are detailed on page two of the agenda bill. Okay, let me just kind of frame things for you. I'll try to explain this to the best of my ability. This is looking out four years, 19 through 2022. Let's look at 19 first. These are the uh, ongoing expenditure reductions, and in 19 you'll see 437,000, that's net, net because while there are technically three FTEs that are uh, identified in this scenario, okay, plus some non-FT related costs, there also is an unfunded mandate regarding police records, and so we added a half FTE beginning in 19, so it nets out to two and a half FTE reduction in 19. Now this is ongoing, so you'll see that it continues from 19, 20, 21, and 22. 
when you get to 2020, you need an additional $374,000 to balance the budget. So the sum of the 811,000 under 2020 plus the 437 gets you that 1.25 million. That's what the total net service reductions are on Julie's table on page two. Or for the biennium, five employees is what, is what the reduction is. But again, a number of reductions are non-employee related. You look out beyond this coming by to 2021, you need an additional 3.44 million in reductions to balance the budget. That equals 31 employees. That's the FTE equivalent. Then when you go 2022, you need an additional $680,000. Okay, that's an additional six employees. Questions on this table? Just to make sure I understand, so the 2.5, I'm looking at the bottom line FTE cuts each year. Yep. 2.5 happens, 2.5 in the 2020 is in addition to the 2.5 yep. in 19. Additive. 31 is in addition yep. to the five that we've already cut, and six is in addition. Each year, that's how many you'd have to cut. Thank you. Yep. So just trying to frame things for you. Uh, under this scenario, again, we're losing about $2 million. Uh, in addition to this 1.25 million in expenditure reductions to help uh, square things away and minimize service level reductions, but you'll see 2021, there's a pretty big cliff, right? In terms of that additional uh, 3.44 million, which equals 31 employees. Okay, uh, on page two, here's a summary of what's mm -hmm. listed there and just trying to frame it by department. So you know, a total of 1.25 million of net reductions, you'll see $215,000 for fire, $136,000 for non-departmental, non about $440,000 for parks and recreation, $100,000 for public works. This is for the biennium, of course. Police, $185,000, and then youth and family services, just under $300,000. There's the police record support and add of $126,000. And just a reminder, this, and just for the benefit of new council members, this is, this is carved in clay at this point. This is seeking preliminary direction from the council. This is Julie's recommendation, your city manager. And uh, as we get into October and November, we'll be reviewing the budget with the council. We'll have more information after uh, 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 the ballot measure is voted on in early November. And let's say it fails, you then can look at this list and you might make some adjustments, right, in November. And, uh, but it's, this is your, your city manager's best recommendation at this point in time under a no levy lift or under a scenario where it doesn't pass. And assuming the 12.5%. Thank you. And assuming the, the, the value of building up that, that target. Okay, quickly, a calendar. Uh, so we're seeking that prelim preliminary direction tonight. So we can, because we're still, usually we've already preliminary finished. Preliminary direction on the contingency fund. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And, uh, and, and also, uh, it's just being okay with, it, with the reductions that are in place, recognizing that we, there are no easy reductions. We have to do something under this scenario. This is what we recommend. And uh, you'll have the opportunity to visit that in detail again in October and in November. We'll deliver the budget to you on October 16th the actual budget document. We'll have a budget overview uh, presentation at that meeting. On October 23rd, we'll review the entire operating budget, which will be broken down by department. Each director will present his or her budget to the council. That's a long meeting. Uh, on November 5th, uh, we'll review the capital budget, the CAP, which is really six years, but we'll focus on the first two years, 19 and 20, as the capital budget portion of the six year CAP. Also look at utility rates that are proposed that same night. November 20th is when you finalize everything. You'll have the results of the levy lift ballot measure. You'll be uh, holding a public hearing. You'll be finalizing changes to the budget, uh, adopting property tax ordinances, adopting utility rate resolutions, and a few other things for that matter. And then finally, in December 4th is when you adopt the 1920 budget. Yes, ma'am. I think Salim's got oh, a question. Oh, sorry. No, I don't want to interrupt the flow, but um, I want to ask a question about these cards that came in the mail. So I got oh assessed card. value yeah okay so I got the assessed value notice in the mail and I think this is kind of uh, a lesson to the community yeah can you tell me since the property value on this card went up about ten percent did the city just solve some part of this financial crisis by this happening can you can you just kind of explain that 
Yeah, uh, it's interesting because I had contacted King County in late July to get an early read on a set evaluation, and I was told at that time, we haven't done Mercer Island yet. And so everywhere else in King County is going up 10 to 11%. We assume the same thing will happen for Mercer Island, but I, I couldn't get a hold of that information. So I've heard from you and from others anecdotally that people seem to 10 to 11% on their individual bills. Does this solve our problem? No. And th this is no different than, than a year ago, okay, where values also went up 10, 11%, and 12% in some cases. And when the council adopted the levy in November of last year, okay, well, a, a assessed valuation was going up 10 to 12 percent. You only have, you set the levy amount, not the levy rate. And so you could set the 2018 levy was 1 percent more than the 2017 levy, plus new construction that was another whatever that was, one something percent. And so the fact that, that assessed valuation went up so much a year ago, that had no benefit to the city. We didn't see a 10 percent increase. If we had, we be having this conversation, right, about a levy lid lift. Uh, and we wouldn't have that even on the ballot measure for that matter. The rate came down to ensure that we collect only 1% more from existing property owners. Can you just tell people what 1% more was last year in terms of dollars? Yeah, that is 100, in round numbers, it was just under $130,000 for the city. And on a, a median assessed value home, 1.2 million, that's 12 bucks. And so said another way, it's about 1.3 employees per year. Uh, because there are, isn't our average cost but when, about fully loaded? It's about a hundred thousand, hundred and five. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I just like to hear from Julie um, on the proposal because I feel like um, either I misunderstood or maybe um, the direction was not clearly provided. Uh, when we started to give direction on the budget. So can you explain how philosophically you went through this? And, and the reason for my question is, I, I thought we as a council, and I could be wrong, it wouldn't be the first time, uh, that we put a priority on public safety and our, our mental health counselors. And so when I went through the spreadsheet that you provided, it shows eliminating geriatric mental health counseling, but yet we're going to keep money in the budget for ARCH, which is an off-island interest. So I'm wondering, did we not give you a good list of priorities to set the budget, or did you have a different philosophy? No, I think um, the council was clear about the school-based counselors and funding that through the 18-19 academic year. That was the direction I got. In addition, um, it was mainly re if the key assumptions was the primary direction. Obviously, when you're talking uh, a $30 million budget and over time, um, one million, and then the subsequent biennium, another four million, it's going to eat into your priorities. It can I, you know, I, I don't know how it can't. I, I, I get that. Yeah. I, I'm just asking um, if we gave you a table similar to the evaluation criteria that we just gave Bob Stowe and the developers, um, and we said public safety, fire, uh, it, it, mental health counselors, et cetera, et cetera, would you have built this budget differently because um, – I kind of put mental health counselors in the same vein as um, safety. Uh, it's early intervention. Sure. Um, there are a lot of shootings and things out there, so I was just surprised to see, see that, that we chose to leave a $50,000 donation to Arch but eliminate one of the positions. Well, I base that on consulting with our directors who provide this service and asking um, uh, for their input on um, my uh, preliminary recommendation. So in essence, I wanna make sure we're providing some level of service. And so they assured me that is still being um, uh, a big part of what's recommended is we're still providing some level of service, maybe not the same level of service, but um, the service is still being provided. So. I think I still feel like I'm meeting your priorities. I'm just reducing some of that. Um, 
obviously over time you may certainly um, have different priorities for me but I'm also going to make remedi recommendations based on um, risk, exposure, you know, things that um, maybe the average citizen isn't necessarily thinking about. And so some of that is also involved in, in my thinking that I would present to the council. Bruce. It's, I guess not so much a question as a bit of history, but maybe a little bit different perspective. Our arch, um, you know, uh, Tom, you speak of it as a as a donation or a contribution, and I, th I think it's important to recognize that uh, it, it serves as a uh, effectively as a department of the city uh, and of the of the surrounding cities that that use it um, in the uh, intent of trying to help alleviate uh, the the homelessness problems that we're seeing and that are very much at our doorstep. And so the, the, I, I would t take a, uh, a different perspective, I guess, in describing it simply as, well, money spent uh, on youth and family services is somehow money spent on our community and, and money that's going to ARCH is somehow uh, simply a donation uh, to, to an outside organization. In both cases, we're trying to provide um, uh, part of the safety net that, that uh, community like ours, um, at least many of the folks in our community would, would perceive as an important part of the, the role that we have as, as a governmental entity. And so the, the decision uh, to, to continue to fund ARCH is something that I would, I would be very supportive of. It's, it's also, if you, um, Council Member Bass, it, you might recall this, it's also part of the GMA requirements as well. So that's a, um, a another factor that goes into what's being presented to you, obviously, are mandates that we're forced to um, think of. And, you know, I think a good one is the records specialist in, involved in the police department. Why would I rank that one above a patrol officer? But when I see the exposure and risk of not delivering records, um, and WCI will not, our risk pool will not support those lawsuits. Those are on us. And so I really want to limit our exposure in, in those cases. So I know that some of this doesn't necessarily make sense on the surface, but those are the kinds of things I'm considering are mandates, r reducing our risk, our liability. Yeah. Okay, I, hold on, oh. Tom. Um, I'm just going to remind council that tonight we have a motion in front of us that pertains to the contingency fund and that there will be weeks and weeks and weeks of opportunity to debate the merits of particular positions, services, programs, et cetera. Um, and rather than get into some of that tonight, prior to all of us having had the opportunity to do some of the homework that we'll all need to do before October, that perhaps we could pull back and come back to the AB. Uh, yeah. Um, it, and I'm just going off of the purpose of this agenda item is to revisit the direction to staff from the June 9th mini planning session. And and I I don't think my question's been answered in far in so far as the priorities with we, which. Julie put a budget together. If we're just going to talk about increasing the reserve fund so that we have to decrease more positions, that, that's definitely one topic. But it was very heavy on reducing positions, and I didn't see very much in the area of reducing other expenses. I mean, there, and, and that's where I'm surprised. I mean, we could cut out the city council meals, it's a small part, or the one-on-one -on -one meals, or any of those things. And I'm wondering why we are eliminating staff positions without seeing those types of reductions in here. So I feel like we as a council didn't outline the priorities correctly in the June 9th mini planning session. The, the only two priorities that are referenced here in this AB, and I'm, I'm just trying to create some clarity here, is the assumption of no levy lid lift 
or sorry, assumes no levy lid lift, meaning it doesn't pass. And I think we've reiterated that. Draws down on all available one-time monies to avoid or minimize service level reductions, um, which is, again, something that I think yeah, I'll leave Julie to elaborate on, but essentially also seeing that $1.99 million um, in one-time funding is going toward the 1920 biennium, I took as, as your interpretation of that. I think it's super important for us to understand these reductions is a preliminary, are a preliminary view. These are not cast in stone. Those conversations, the specific conversations, will happen in October as we go through the different departmental reviews, fund reviews, et cetera. So I, I understand that it's an important question. I'm not sure I'm understanding the extent to which it pertains to tonight's. Well, I'm just going from the language, and I take it very literally, that there is the council dis directed staff to build a budget that, one, assumes no levy lift. Absolutely true. We did that. All of us sat up here and reiterated we wanted to see cost containment during that discussion as well. We also reiterated how important the, the counselors were. We also reiterated public safety. We talked about the survey. I went back and I reviewed the tape. So granted, those detailed discussions are going to come in October, but Julie's got a lot of work to do and she reiterates to us over and over that she's overworked and understaffed. We don't give her a clear direction up front. She might come back, and we'll make mincemeat of it later. And then we're scrambling to the finish line. I'm just asking a simple question: How did we prioritize eliminating jobs and public safety over other reductions? And I don't understand that. So I was just asking for that clarification so that I could move forward. So I. Okay, I thought I said I consulted with directors in getting their advice on whether or not I could, in essence, still maintain quality level of service and also still find 1.2 million in reductions. And so I didn't do this in a vacuum. I consulted with all my directors on this. So I'm trying my best to maintain, you know, and, and try not to um, impact our residents. This is what I was able to do. And I think you may have, a, you know, a different outcome you want to see. In light of, we had January 9th, you gave us some really clear direction. Even with that direction, we still had to balance the budget with a roughly 430000 in cuts. Since hearing on Jul in early July, management partners saying y your um, uh, y one your assumptions and your forecast is reasonable, so that's good. Um, but hey, you haven't even factored into your forecast a recession, and boy, your contingency fund is woefully low. I thought it. I thought I should return to council because we didn't get into a very detailed discussion that evening, of course to say, well, now's the time before we spend down all the one-time money that we have to try to save a little bit more for a rainy day. So before I work with staff to build you a balanced budget, I thought it would be prudent if I returned to the council and sought your direction on that, if you want to do that. And that's really what tonight is about. Salim? Yeah, so I'll just build on that. I I agree with Julie. Uh, I remember distinctly because I was the person that made the motion of how that waterfall might solve a biennium budget gap, and it did leave YFS completely unfunded, which is the 400000 <coughs> that you're talking about. Uh, all this move is doing is is the council giving you direction after having received the management partner's uh, update. And there was quite a bit that was done with that. There, there was the, the insertion of the, of the recession, but there was also the optimizations, and there was... Uh, some true ups on growth and mm -hmm. spending, but largely we ended up where we started. Uh, and so I would support this motion of, of bolstering the contingent funds. Yeah, I think we can see pretty clearly that, you know, two and a half FTEs, two and a half FTEs, 31, whatever it was, 31, 33, uh, all we're doing here by, by not spending down the reserves is pushing pain a little bit further off. It doesn't go very far, but if this, if these are the recommendations of the directors and the directors feel that uh, they might be able to get through a biennium and hold service levels where they are. Uh, 
I, I'm not going to question their guidance on that. Did you want to make a motion? So I'm going to move to adopt the 1.5 months contingency fund target as outlined uh, in the staff's budget balancing recommendation. Second. All right, council, it's a motion's been made and seconded. Comments? So I will support this motion, um, but with a bit of hesitation. And, and that hesitation is because uh, if, you, if you look at these cuts, you can begin to see um, some significant uh, decrease in services to our community, but it's nothing to what's coming in the biennium after that yeah. if, um, if that's where we end up, if the, if the levy lid lift doesn't pass. We, we're looking at, at uh, six times the cuts, uh, you know, five versus 31, just in, well, it, except it was 31 plus another six, six, so it's 37 versus just five, so it's seven times uh, as many cuts. So to my mind, if we were to change anything, what we would do is actually cut deeper now to set aside more money such that we smooth the curve going into that second biennium uh, such that we are we are um, not, I mean, what you essentially would do is set aside a bit of money such that you, you are, uh, rather than cutting 37 jobs in that biennium, you're, you're cutting something less than that. And uh, I think from a continuity of service standpoint, that would, would make sense. But uh, I, I think that is so drastic, the effect on our community is so drastic that we really will have no choice but to uh, find uh, a, another approach to this and, and uh, it, it will force us into, uh, of course, taking severe cuts, but it will also force us into um, doing, taking other, other, other steps to try and increase revenues. Um, and uh, so if, if we're going to change this, that's the direction I would, I would suggest changing it. But I think it, you've, you've struck a good balance, uh, Chip, with what you've proposed here and, and Julie with what you've proposed here. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to support this and as we get into this budget season. It's, it's going to be, um, uh, I think, difficult for all of us to, to accept if that, that is where we end up. But that, you know, may, that may be the nature of the beast. Tom? Yeah, I, I am. It, and Bruce, what you're saying really resonates with me. Um, it, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm still very surprised because usually when I've been through ups and downs in the economy and manage budgets, very large budgets, and usually we look for process improvements, administrative expenses, and, and waste. And I, I, if the levy doesn't pass, I don't believe that eliminating the geriatric specialist or the school counselors is the right solution. Um, if we can identify process improvements and those administrative costs, we could preserve and protect those positions. But I also heard Julie say that she talked to the directors and there'd be no loss of service. So uh, like Salim said, I respect the directors and if they don't need those positions. Mm -hmm. I don't think she said no loss of service. I think she said reduction in service, preserving some element. But Julie, I'll let you. That's yeah, well, yeah. Wha whatever. I mean, we can go back and look at the tape later. Uh, but when the when we talk about public safety and in one of our officers and in those areas um, with light rail coming and all of the new pressures on the system, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. So um, I, I don't think I'll su support this um, proposal as it stands right now. And I just hope um, that going forward, we'll, we'll look at some process improvements rather than the, the head count reductions. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and weigh in. And, and I think Bruce raises some interesting points. Um, yes, I'm going to support this. I think it's important to build that contingency fund for all the out reasons that have been outlined. But equally so, we're still using almost $2 million in one-time funding to bridge the biennium. Um, we have a financial sustainability plan that I think we are all, I'm sensing, committed to whether the levy passes or not. It's a requirement of the levy 
but I certainly wouldn't see it exclusive to the levy. And I would also ask Julie and staff, as we prepare for what's coming in that second biennium, we've had a lot of conversations about learning how to do business differently. And I think that's some of what Tom is alluding to, be they, um, I wouldn't say waste, but certainly there's different ways to do the work that we've done to date, perhaps more efficient, different, but more efficient. Does the staff have the, and I'm just gonna say resourcing, because that can be people, dollars, time, et cetera, to pursue some of those different projects that came up in conversations with the CAG, such as evaluating our fire delivery, evaluating our social services delivery, and evaluating our court services, et cetera. So we don't have to answer that tonight, but I would encourage you to make sure that when you do come to us that there is resourcing available to do the really, really hard work that's gonna set us up for the biennium 21-22. Council, <coughs> any more questions, comment, or are we ready for a vote? Clarifying question. Mm -hmm. Hey, Julie, who, who manages all the counselors, the community counselors? It's all through YFS and not the school board, right? So then it's our responsibility to apply for grants and funding. And the reason why I'm asking that is that the October 26 review the question was brought up by, by maybe David D'Souza or somebody like that, um, that there's a lot of funding out there and we pay about $2 million into the system. And I just read another article that said $12.6 million have been granted to almost every single uh, uh, school entity except for Mercer Island and maybe uh, another one. And I'm just wondering, are we on top of that? I mean, it's- Are it, you referencing it, the best starts for kids? Yeah, because um, we have, I, I'd like to know how many grants we applied for. I know, Cindy, I watched the tape today and you said you were bird dogging and you were gonna apply. And does that yeah. factor into the budget at all? Yeah, um, we follow all of the best starts for kids funding. And we have, we um, we don't really, they, 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 uh, they give funds in large amounts to larger entities, and it's often not small shops like we are. So I've reached out to some organizations that we could we could work with. We would be a small piece of what they do. There hasn't been a good match yet. We don't really match. It's gonna be very hard to qualify for some of those. Our demographics don't match up, so it's unlikely that we will get that. I, we I will do whatever we can. And it, I, I mean, I trust you, but yeah. it's it just every yeah. other district yeah. got funding except for us. And are you going by school district or well, why? Maybe we can yeah, there's different funding difference. Yeah. yeah, I just want to say that we're following the, the best we can and making as many collaborative um, uh, relationships that we can and we've not met a match yet, so. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, council, are we ready for a vote? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. All right, motion passes 4-1. So that actually concludes um, the okay. agenda bills and we now move on to other business. Uh, do we have any upcoming council, well, first let's just go ahead and excuse the council members that are absent, is, if we choose to. Is there a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Are you, are you in favor, Tom? Oh yeah, I second it, aye, yeah. Okay, great. All right, so now do we have any upcoming council member absences to report, to anticipate. We have a busy fall, hoping everybody's gonna be here. Hey, w where did we fall in that one meeting? I saw an email, something about um, we accidentally scared on Yom Kippur. We're gonna hit the planning schedule next. Okay. And that I can see the two would be interrelated. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay. Well, I just will uh, again mention, I will miss uh, the second October meeting and the additional special meeting that's in October, unfortunately. Okay. All right, with that, Julie, the planning schedule. I'm sorry, Mayor. Councilor Bassett, which meetings would you be missing? October? It's the October, I think it's a 16 and a 26 or something like. I think uh, 23 is the special meeting. Yes. Thank you, Celine. Thank you. Um, so council, if you um, want to get into the planning schedule, I'd like to see if you would be available for a executive session next 
um, Tuesday, September 4th at 5.30 to 6 regarding potential litigation. Um, that is something we just, uh, just today realized we need to consult with you on. Regarding um, our conflict with uh, Yom Kippur, I did ask council members if you might be available instead on Monday the 17th. It looked like most council members were available. Another option would be the following week on September 25th, so it really comes, you know, it's really up to the council at this point, but I have heard um, really for most council members who felt the 17th would work fine. Fine for me. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. And All executive right. session's fine for me. Okay. It, did you say for executive <coughs> session it was a half hour or an hour? We think we will only need 30 minutes. Okay. So 5.30. Yes. And we'll And that's next week. Provide, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next week. And then um, we, in consultation with the mayor and deputy mayor, um, typically that last meeting in December we uh, cancel it but we would like to add fiscal sustainability plan to that last meeting so um, if you hopefully um, are not out of town and can uh, attend that meeting I think it will set us up quite well um, for important topics ahead so if you can make sure you're here for that so just uh it's December 18th, and interestingly enough, the Mercer Island School District is not getting out till the following week. So those of us who have kids have a high probability of being in town. Okay, you can do. The school district is actually out until the 7th of January. No, the, so preceding the two weeks, so there, we're in school, if I read the calendar correctly. Let me. In session, thank you, in session through the 21st. <laughs> and then um, I, yeah. You may not have noticed um, also a special meeting that I am on December 11th, and this is where we'd like to get in the practice of having you meet jointly with the Planning Commission and get in the habit of really defining their work plan for the year. And so that meeting is really designed to um, look and review their work plan and um, obviously all celebrate successes of the work plan that they've just completed. So if you can make sure you have that on your calendar, that would be great. As long as we're talking about dates, I noted that uh, January, uh, our first meeting in January would be on New Year's Day. Is that something we're looking at changing? It works for me, but if there was uh, an intent to, yeah, an intent to change According that, to we your rules, that as well. Yeah, so if that happens according to your rules, it would happen on January 2nd would be your meeting. I've put on the planning schedule potentially canceling that, but then that means you wouldn't meet until January 15th, so. Because again, school is out on January 2nd. Right. So we had some conversations with Allie, and I, I think, because then we're backing up against the planning session as well. That's right. And, you know, pretty heavy workload even coming out of the budget season. Right. So I'd say keep your calendars at hand, and hopefully in the next week or two we'll so be able to provide some line of sight into January and February. Okay, so you don't want to have us pencil in the 8th, shifting it a week right now. I mean, that would be my thought is if you need yeah. a meeting in there, that would be the logical time to do it. But. Um, if you don't mind, we can pencil that in as a potential meeting. We I can. I thought there was a... There's some reason. I thought there was there? a reason. But if it's in pencil, sure. Yeah. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Some money, Dave. <laughs> uh, Thank you. The... the uh, the two questions I have is um, on the planning schedule, the code of conduct and ethics issue. Is that on an agenda yet? Oh, yes, Councilmember Acker. We have tentatively scheduled that for your October 16th meeting, code of ethics. 
And, um, oh, I wanted to also note, um, currently Initiative 1631 was tentatively scheduled for October 2nd, but we will um, be able to move that up to September 17th. And then, Bruce, that topic that you and I covered the other day, do you want to grab that? Uh, well, sure. I mentioned it to Julie in a conversation we had the other day that uh, the, the not weed um, topic has been... Um, yes. Raised here in the council. Our new parks director has that on her work plan, as well as our city attorney. Okay. So, um, but given how loaded your schedules are, it's possible that won't orbit back around to the council to your planning session. So. Thank you. Yeah, the, the only reason I asked, uh, in, and maybe it doesn't even need to come back in here, but some Bruce and I are both pretty vested in, and maybe we could. Oh, no, on. you'll need to review it because I don't, I, I guess I'm not envisioning it's going to be that simple. Oh, okay. But I, but I want to consult with our Parks and Rec director and, and, and um, have her advise us on that. And we should welcome because this her because this is her I believe her first official city council member not the first time she's been with us but you joined August first and so we have not met since late July <laughs> you feel like a seasoned Mercer Island <laughs> leadership team member Ju Julie I would just point I would just point out that Paul was the one who highlighted to me the the the, the idea and it caught me by surprise but immediately made sense but that. What we're talking about here is not our parks, but private properties, and therefore this is perhaps more a DSG uh, topic, although I think parks would certainly be an informative source for information about it. But just right. as, you're, as you're thinking about who, who to have in the room, I think you'll, I, you'll find um, that that's necessary. Thank you. Yes, I was looking at it m more comprehensively, like if um, you were wanting to have some carrots and some sticks in the approach which is where I thought parks might be helpful. But let's talk about that because I do think it's an you know really admirable to have that vision for the island and, and I'm just wanting to set it up for the greatest chance of success. And I think you meant Paul West. Yeah. Okay. okay, any further questions regarding planning schedule? All right, there are no board appointments this evening. However, just to clarify, we will have two appointments to the Design Commission scheduled for discussion and vote next week, September 4th. And that leaves us with council member reports. Council member Acker. Um, I don't know if Julie mailed it on to full council, but um, I've been getting a lot of feedback on the line bikes, almost all very positive the kids love them in particular <laughs> to go around the island but there were three concerns and I sent it to Julie and um, she's looking at it and uh, it, it, it might be something that we have to revisit when we get back into the contract performance. Celine? Bruce? I will miss it but I note that we got a town hall meeting uh, flyer from our King County Council Member Claudia Balducci. She'll be here on September 15th at the Community Center for a town hall meeting and would encourage citizens to think about attending that if they'd like to hear from her what's up or let her know what they think should be up. Dave? Uh, just two quick things. One, a, a shout out to the police department uh, who did a fantastic job with, with Seafair and managing all of that as, as uh, for everybody in TV land, Mercer Island uh, manages the event and brings together, I think, seven different law enforcement agencies, and it just runs super, super smoothly. And, and uh, uh, a big shout out to the to the department and all the Marine Patrol. The second thing is, I um, wanted to say, great job on Let's Talk Mercer Island. If you haven't seen that and registered for that, it's really cool, and I think it represents exactly the kind of communication strategy that we had hoped for when we asked you to come join us, Julie, and it's it's just super clear. And, and uh, like I use the comprehensive plan as an example, where it's broken into sections and super digestible. So it's just really well done. Want to say thanks for sort of bringing us to the vision that that you told us about. And I'd reiterate, I've had some conversations with citizens who have enjoyed it so far. So that's good. 
I have nothing, or at least nothing that's probably worthy of another two minutes. So with that, we are adjourned, and we'll see you next month. We started a couple minutes late. Oh, we did.